Hello, beautiful souls. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. My name is Carolyn and this channel is all about true crime, mystery, and anything abnormal. I highly recommend subscribing because this channel is definitely a vibe. I want to say a huge thank you to all my returning subscribers. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you. And if you're new here, welcome. Today, we're talking about the most complicated and expensive murder investigation in Ohio's history. We are talking about the Roden family massacre. On the morning of April 22nd, 2016, Bobby Jo Manley got up and was starting her morning routine, which involved going to other family members' homes to feed their pets. In this story, there are a lot of people involved and there are a lot of locations involved. This was a massacre of an entire family, but this wasn't a family that all lived in one household. There was a piece of land in Pike County where there were three residents. There were three different trailers with three different family member groups living kind of in these three areas. So when Bobby Joe went to the first house, it was Chris, her ex-brother-in-law, and Gary, who was Chris's cousin. She had her own key because it was normal daily practice for her to go over and feed the pets in the morning. So she went up to the trailer, opened the door, and walked in. And what she saw was absolutely horrific. As soon as she saw the horrific scene, she obviously left the trailer. She called 911. On the 911 call, she said that her ex-brother-in-law, speaking about Chris Roden, she said that he had been beaten to death. Now that is not going to be what his cause of death was, but she also said to them, they're all dead. So far, she had discovered two bodies and they were both deceased. But this was just the beginning of the discoveries that would be made in the next few hours. After the 911 call was made, Bobby Joe and a friend ran to a nearby trailer that had other family members living in there. And inside this trailer, she found the deceased bodies of Frankie Roden and his fiance, Hannah Gilly. They were both deceased. There were two children in the trailer, a three-year-old boy who was Frankie's son and the couple's six-month-old infant. Both of them had not been physically harmed. Bobby Joe's older brother, James, then went into a third trailer that was nearby the two trailers where the bodies had already been discovered. When he went inside, he found the deceased body of Dana, who was the ex-wife of Chris Roden, who was in the trail, the first trailer where bodies were discovered. In the trailer with Dana, there were also Dana and Chris's two children. Their children were Chris and Hannah Roden, they were both deceased. Hannah also had a four day old baby who was in the trailer covered in blood. Now, at this point, nobody knew this. This comes out much later, but just to give you an idea of how brutal this massacre was, investigators believe that when Hannah was shot, she was breastfeeding her four day old baby and the killer would later state that she had been breastfeeding when he shot her. He then rearranged Hannah's body and the four-day-old infant so the infant could continue breastfeeding from her deceased mother's body. This four-day-old infant is covered in blood and she is breastfeeding from a corpse. And to me, that was one of the most disturbing parts of this case because 
This case is so huge and the killers at the time would have known how huge this was going to be because this was a complete massacre. I haven't even, there's still another victim I haven't discussed yet, but this infant, obviously four days old, has no idea what's going on, but that infant is going to grow up and the, because the case was so public, one day this infant is going to know that they breastfed from their mother's body when she was deceased. And to me, that's just so disturbing. Like the amount of trauma that the th there was three children. So there's the four day old baby who's Hannah, who's the one I'm talking about right now. And then in the last trailer, there was a three year old and a six month old. These kids are going to be traumatized. Like I can't even imagine. And later that same day, there was another trailer that was about a 15 minute drive away where Kenneth Roden was found deceased in his trailer. So seven of the family members were found in trailers that were all on pieces of land on Union Hill Road in Picton. And then the other one was found 15 minutes away in a trailer as well. So I know that that was a lot of names coming at you. So I'm gonna go through the family tree so you can get a really good understanding of how all these people are related. So first we have Chris Roden Sr. who is 40 years old. He was one of the men killed in the first trailer. Then you have his ex-wife, 37 year old Dana Roden, who was in the third trailer. Their three children, Hannah Roden, who was 19, she was the mother of the four-day-old baby. She also had a two-year-old daughter, but the two-year-old daughter was at another location when the murders happened. Then you have Chris Roden Jr., who was 16, and both Hannah and Chris Jr. were found in the tra the third trailer with their mother, Dana. Also, there is the third son of Christopher Roden Sr. and Dana Roden, who is Clarence Frankie Roden. He was 20 years old, and he was in the second trailer. And I'm just going to refer to him as Frankie from now on because that's what he goes by. That's what he did go by. And um, also Frankie's fiance was Hannah Gilly. She was 20 years old as well. And with them was the three-year-old and the six-month-old. But the three-year-old and the six-month-old were not killed. The two other men killed was Kenneth Roden. He was 44 and he was the brother of Chris Roden Sr. He was the last body found and he was found alone about a 15 minute drive away from the other family members. And then there was the cousin Gary Roden who was 37 and he was in the first trailer with Christopher Sr. So in the massacre, eight members of the Roden family were killed. All eight family members were shot execution style. Some had been shot several times, some only shot once. So the police obviously were on the scene quite quickly, trying to figure out who would come and massacre an entire family. The very first thought was that this had been one of the eight had gone and killed the other seven and then unalived themselves. But this was very quickly ruled out because nobody was shot at close range. So none of the victims had gunshots that could have been self-inflicted. So first off the bat, they know that's not what this is. But it was very well planned and it was very well executed, which is something that the police found quite chilling. 
And I'll put up a picture here of the piece of land this happened on so that you can see that there's trailers, there's a lot of cars, there's, there's a lot going on on this property. So it was a very extensive search. They had to search, obviously, the trailers where the people were killed, but then there was there were other buildings on the property. And as they were searching all of the property that the Roden family owned, they came across a very extensive and professional grow up. So it became clear very quickly that this family was running a huge marijuana grow up operation. So then they started thinking, could this have been something to do with the cartel? Police were open to any possibilities at this point. And they were pretty confident that there had been more than one shooter. And they were also warning other members of this family because there's a whole bunch of family members who were not murdered. And the police basically advised them that your lives could be in danger. Like somebody has come in and massacred the family. Who knows if they want to kill other family members. So for a long time, the public perception was that it had to somehow be cartel related. That was kind of the belief at the beginning. I think that's where the public was going because the marijuana operation they had was extensive. They, were, they found three huge grow ups and the number of plants was just astronomical. So they were selling a lot of marijuana. So that's where the cartel comes in. But it gets ruled out that this is not something that was cartel related. So if it wasn't committed by one of the people who had died, it wasn't cartel related. They started thinking like, who would do this? Who would have the motive to kill all eight family members? But it wasn't until October 2016 that the police made a public statement stating that they did not believe that this massacre was cartel related. But that was six months after the crime had happened. When the police announced that they didn't believe this was cartel related, they stated that they believed that it was someone or someone local who was very familiar with the entire property and also very familiar with each trailer and who lived where. Like they believed it was someone who knew when they came to this property that they knew exactly where to go and they knew who they were going to find in which areas. But they still had no idea who it was or they were not saying publicly who they suspected. The public started becoming really concerned that this would never be solved. But then in May, 2017, so almost one year after the massacre, the SWAT team and police began a search of a property. It was a property that was about a 10 minute drive from the property where the rodents were found. And they conducted a massive search of this property. So this is where a whole other family becomes involved in the story. The property that the police were searching was the property of the Wagner family. The Wagner family consisted of the father, George Billy Wagner, who I'll just be referring to him as Billy from now on. He's the father. Then there's the mother, Angela Wagner, and their two sons, George Wagner and Edward Jake Wagner, who I'll be referring to as Jake. So I'm sure you're thinking, who the hell are the Wagners and what do they have to do with this? So these two families knew each other. So the connection between these two families is, the first connection is Billy 
Wagner, who is the father of the Wagner family, used to buy weed from Chris Roden Sr., who is the father of the Roden family. So the two fathers, one father used to buy weed from the other father. But nobody's killing each other over a little bit of weed. So to understand the real connection between this family, we got to go back about six years. So six years earlier, Jake Wagner, who is one of the sons of the Wagner family, is 18 years old. Hannah Roden, who is the daughter of Chris Sr. Roden, the dad who sells weed, she is 13 years old. Now, in all the sources that I read, it was stated that Jake, 18, and Hannah, 13, had a relationship. But if we use our brain cells, we know that a 13-year-old child cannot be in a relationship with a grown-ass man at 18. So I'm not going to refer to this as a relationship. But the two of them began a sexual relationship when Hannah was 13 years old. When Hannah became 15, she got pregnant. So if you remember at the, while I was describing the crime scenes, when I talked about Hannah, she had the four day old baby. That was not Jake's baby. That was another man's baby. But I also had mentioned that she had a two year old daughter who was at another location when this massacre took place. That child is Jake Wagner's daughter. So Hannah and Jake had a child together. And there was a lot of contention between the two families. Jake and Hannah were in a custody battle over the two-year-old child. Jake wanted full custody and Hannah was not willing to give up her rights to her own daughter. So the two of them are going back and forth. And basically the Wagner family are trying to pressure Hannah into signing custody over to Jake. And Hannah is saying, hell no, not giving up my daughter, especially to a man who at 18 has sexual interest in a 13 year old child. So, before the murders, they're going back and forth, and it is getting ugly. It was to the point that the whole family was involved. The reason why this whole family killed this whole family is all over this custody dispute, and everybody's involved in it. So, one thing the Wagner family did was they were basically stalking Hannah. The Wagner family seemed as though they were kind of stalking the Roden family. Now, leading up to the murder, they definitely stalked the family, stalked their patterns, made sure they knew who lived where, who slept where, who was going where, who was doing what. But before the murders, they were stalking Hannah and a lot of the other family members. So I haven't mentioned, there's a whole other group, there's a whole other group to the Roden family. I'm not gonna mention any of their names because there's just way too many people involved. But what the Wagner family was doing was the Wagner family was hacking into the Facebook accounts of Hannah Roden and all of the Roden family. They, they had hacked, her, her aunts, her mother, her father, and da, 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 like all these people. So the Wagner family is reading any private messages that are being sent between the Roden family. And this whole thing, the tipping point was a DM that was sent from Hannah to her aunt on Facebook. So when Jake and Hannah were together, Jake was very abusive to Hannah. Not only was he essaying her because she was a child, it's assault of a sexual nature. And he was also physically abusive to her. And he had, he would abuse her physically. He had tried to strangle her at one point, trying to force her 
first of all, when she had her second child, who he was not the father of, he wanted her to put him on the birth certificate as the father, but they weren't in a relationship. Like they weren't together. And at one point he attacked Hannah and tried to strangle Hannah in an attempt to force her to sign a custody agreement that his mother had written out. And Hannah refused because Hannah was not giving up custody of her daughter. And she sure as hell was not giving up custody of her daughter to the psychopath family. So Hannah was talking with her aunt on Facebook through DMs. And she said to her aunt that Jake had tried to force her to sign this custody agreement. And she said, I will not sign this. They'll have to kill me first. And Angela Wagner, who is Jake's mother, read this message because she had access to everyone's Facebook. So she would just go in and read everything that anybody was talking about. And at that point, the Wagner family decided, okay, over your dead body, this is going to happen. So the Wagner family started planning. They started by stalking the family, which I mentioned earlier. They would pay attention to what times everyone did everything that they did throughout the day. And all of them had been on the family property. They had been in these trailers before. So they knew this property and this location very well because most of them had been there before. The father used to go there to buy drugs and obviously Jake had been there because at one point he was dating and I can't say dating because she's 13 and he's 18, but they together, however you want to say it. <clears throat> so after they had stalked the family to kind of learn their routines, learn who would go to where, when, and who slept in which trailers, once they had all of that information, they started stockpiling supplies. The Wagner family bought ammunition a magazine clip, they made a silencer, and they also studied counter surveillance on the Roden family property, tampered with phones, security cameras, they made notes of which pets were on the property and where the pets were so that they could go in execution style, massacre this family, and get away with it. So going back to the timeline, June 19th, 2017, the police put out a message to the public that they would like their assistance with any information that the public could provide regarding the Wagner family. And conveniently at this point, some of the Wagner family had relocated to Alaska wonder why. Finally, November 13th, 2018, six members of the Wagner family were arrested. The six family members that were arrested was Billy Wagner, who is the father, Angela Wagner, who is the mother, Jake Wagner, who is the son, and George Wagner, who is another, their other son. Also, the two grandmothers were arrested. The charges end up getting dropped for one of the grandmothers because there was confusion around a purchase that she, she had bought two bulletproof vests. And when they had gone to massacre the family, they had worn bulletproof vests, but she ended up proving that she'd actually bought the bulletproof vests after the massacre because she was afraid that her grandson, somebody would try to kill them after the fact. So everything against her gets dropped. The other grandmother, she did like 90 days for perjury. She wasn't involved in any of the planning. She didn't know this was gonna happen. So the two grandmothers, they're out of the story at this point. It's the four family members who planned it. 
So on the evening of April 21st, 2017, which is the night before the bodies are discovered. So Billy Wagner contacts Chris Wagner because he wants to come buy some weed. So the two dads. So Chris Roden Sr., he just assumed, you know, Billy was coming as he had done many, many times. And he would come in, give him the money, do the deal, and Billy would leave. And it was just, you know, something that had happened on a regular basis and was nothing suspicious. But what he didn't know was Billy didn't arrive alone. When Billy arrived, his two sons, Jake and George, were hiding in the back seat of his car. The first two bodies discovered, Chris Roden Sr. and his cousin, Gary Roden, they were actually the first two killed. So what had happened was Billy went into the trailer with Jake behind him, and then Jake had shot and killed both Chris and Gary. Then the father and the two sons proceeded to go to the other three locations and execution style take out everyone and the police at this point when they had done a search of the Wagner family property they found mountains of evidence there, there was no question that the prosecutors were going to be able to prove that these four people had planned and executed this massacre but of course at first everybody's like oh we're not you know we're innocent we're innocent we're innocent and that wasn't gonna work there was way way too much evidence against them finally five years to the day after the massacre on april 21st 2021 jake wagner who is the son who was in the custody dispute with hannah he pleads guilty he admitted to killing five of the eight people. And part of his plea deal was, because this is Ohio, they have the death penalty. And people in the community, people all over, like this was a huge case. Everyone wanted the death penalty. So part of Jake's deal was he would plead guilty to the murders as long as the death penalty was taken off the table for himself, his brother, his mother, and his father. So in the plea deal with Jake, they will not seek the death penalty for any of the him or the other three family members. Jake had claimed the reason for the massacre was that he had believed that his two-year-old daughter that he shared with Hannah was being essayed, not by Hannah, but he didn't specify who he believed, but he believed well in the care of Hannah, she was being essayed. And I have no idea if that is true or if it's not. I, I really don't know. I don't think anyone really knows, but the only person that we know for sure that essayed a child is Jake. So, mm, Jake, I don't know. So Jake pleads guilty to eight counts of murder, a whole bunch of other charges, all relating to the murder, the cover-up, and evidence tampering, and all kinds of, you know, all these smaller charges. But basically, the four, or the eight counts of murder he pled guilty to. And one of the charges was unlawful sexual conduct with a minor for the abuse that he had done to Hannah. And I just, I really love that they included that because if you're into true crime and you know how prison works, when someone who has done something to a child goes to prison, Sometimes there's a little prison justice for those kind of crimes, which I don't encourage, but I'm not against. So enjoy, Jakey boy. Enjoy. And Jake was then sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences 
without the possibility of parole. So that mofo's gonna die in prison. They're all gonna die in prison. Well, the father, his case hasn't actually been settled yet, but we'll get there. September 10th, 2021, the mother, Angela Wagner, she pled guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and a bunch of other charges. She had not actually gone to the Roden family property on the night of the murder. It was the father and the two sons. They were the three that went to the property and actually executed the murders. But the mother planned the shit out of this. Now, she this is all very recent. So she pled guilty in September 2021. She hasn't been sentenced yet. So we don't know yet how long she will spend in prison, but I will imagine that she will spend the rest of her life in prison the same way I believe all of them will. George Wagner, who is the other brother, he pled not guilty and he went to trial. And in going to trial is how we found out so much information about the crime. Because what happens, obviously you're watching this, you love true crime. You know, when somebody just admits, pleads guilty, takes a plea, we don't always find out all the details of the crime. But we ended up finding out all the details because George pled not guilty. And the jury said, mm, hell no, bitch, you're going to prison too. December 19th, 2022, so just the end of last year, not even that long ago, he was sentenced to eight consecutive life sentences plus 121 years. The father, Billy, he has not gone to trial or taken a plea deal as of yet. I think it, because for Ohio, just just George's trial alone cost a million dollars just for George's trial, who's the brother. So this was so expensive and so extensive. Obviously, Ohio, like the county itself would have gone bankrupt. They couldn't, they couldn't afford this investigation. They couldn't afford these trials. Like the government had to come in and assist them in paying for all of the cost associated with this. So the father, he's the last one. He, he will end up spending the rest of his life in prison. If he pleads guilty, he's going to get eight life sentences, the same as his son. And if he tries to go to trial, he'll get probably eight life sentences plus 121 years like his other son. But it hasn't actually happened yet. He is in prison, but he hasn't actually, um, we don't know what his sentence is, but he'll rot in prison for the rest of his life as well, I'm sure. And I no don't normally do such recent cases because, uh, for example, in this case, we don't know the outcome of the father. I will do a little update, maybe like a little short, like, couple two or three minute video when the father gets sentenced. I'll put that up on um, YouTube just so you can know kind of the conclusion. So that is the end of today's video. I hope that it was not too confusing to you. I do apologize. There wasn't a video last week. The reason there wasn't a video last week was because this was supposed to be last week's video, but I had to do a lot more research just trying, I like just to figure out the sequence of each person who was killed in what order. Every like th this was the hardest case I've researched so far. I will let you know that. So let me know what you think of the video. I hope it didn't come across too chaotic. I tried to keep it straight. Um, when I go to edit, I'm going to be putting in a lot of pictures and family trees so that hopefully it will come a lot. It won't be so complicated when you guys are watching this, but let me know what you think and let me know what kind of cases you're interested in. This is a newer case. I did this case because I got a request on Instagram that uh, somebody wanted me to do newer cases. So let me know, do you like old cases? Do you like new cases, combination? I know for me, I prefer doing cases that 
I haven't heard of or I don't anticipate a lot of people have heard of. I'm not really into doing big cases that have been done a hundred times because you don't need to hear me tell you a story you've heard a hundred times. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed the video. I really appreciate you uh, sticking around to the end of the video. If you'd like to support the channel, um, definitely stick around and watch another video if you'd like and comment down below if you have any suggestions for what cases you would like me to do next time. So I hope you all have an amazing day and I will see you in the next one.